lighten things up a little bit further, but probably very much the same mindset. Uh, having uh, performed in 40 states of our own 50, uh, doing tours at colleges around the country, and uh, managing on one hand to make you laugh, and on another hand make you wonder like crazy, I'd like to invite Michael Kent up on stage. Cool. My, uh, I want to tell you about the, the conception of magic. How magic starts. We can go, my first slide is a title slide, so yeah. And I apologize if you read that as the magic of conception, that's a different thing. <laughs> there was actually another Pachaka Cha that where they talked about that. But So that's me. Uh, I wanted to talk about how does a magic trick start? From the beginning, how does a magician decide something is impossible and B, I'm going to convince someone that I'm able to do that impossible thing. So here's David Copperfield, that's me, that's David Copperfield, walking through the Great Wall of China. How did he decide, I'm going to walk through the Great Wall of China? Did he start small, I'm going to walk through a Burger King, and then it got bigger? Like, How do you decide what you're going to do? And every artist has their own creative process. For me, uh, well, first of all, let's look at some, when you're a magician, uh, you get to decide what your creative process is going to be. This is the finished result. This is me performing the chicken trick, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, a signed playing card ends up inside a rubber chicken that is somewhere else, that someone else is holding. So, a lot of magicians will start with the basic building blocks to magic. There are only nine magic tricks. You can make something appear, you can make something disappear, transform, restore, you can escape, you can levitate like Chris Angel, you can read people's minds, or there's basic like solid through solid penetration. By the way, I don't advise uh, searching Google images for penetration. Um, but that's not where I started. I don't start with the magic trick, I started with the feeling. I wanted to, the creation of feeling, I, wanted, I like Pee Wee Herman in that he, cre he combined like an adult feeling with childlike wonder. He butted heads between the zany and this organic like adult humor, right? And for me, the icon that popped into my head was a rubber chicken. And the rubber chicken has this sort of zany, like, hacky, clown-like comedy thing to it. But I wanted to do a card trick uh, that was sort of organic and, like, magic-y, you know? And I dress in normal clothes when I perform. Uh, I don't dress like a clown or anything. I thought that would be a cool little juxtaposition, those two things to butt heads. Uh, and I, I figured out right away, someone else has to be holding the chicken. If I'm holding the chicken and I make the card go into the chicken, it's sleight of hand. If someone else is holding the chicken, that's magic. And that's the difference. Uh, so I figured out a method to do this, to make a signed playing card inside a rubber chicken, or show up inside a rubber chicken. Uh, but it had to be my signature on the playing card. I'll let you figure out how I did that. It wasn't very baffling. Uh, there was an extra card. And this is me, look at that awesome shirt I was wearing. Awesome. Uh, so. I had to figure out a better method. I needed the signature to be the person, the other person's signature, the person that's on stage with me. So I went to my books. Here's my library of magic, and, and that, the book that I actually found was, it's on the second shelf, you can't see it. But there was a book, uh, the guy's name's David Roth, he figured out, or he had a, a, I don't want to give away secrets, there's a secret of magic that was in that book that allowed me to do the chicken trick, and I used that, I adapted it uh, to the chicken trick and performed it a lot, and I rehearsed it and practiced it a lot. Here's me on the front page of the lantern doing the chicken trick. I started doing it on the road, 80 to 100 colleges a year. I started performing this trick, and it sort of wrote itself. Uh, you know, I practiced the magic part a lot, but then the trick itself, after every show, I would take notes on what happened. What funny thing happened tonight? I'd go to the, the bar at the hotel or whatever and sit and take notes of what happened that didn't happen last night that was funny. Here's an example. One night, I told the girl on stage to hold the chicken like this, and then I told her to go like this with her other hand, and I said, you see where this is going? And someone in the audience yelled, Facebook. <laughs> this is the exact moment. I have a picture of it. That's the exact moment that happened. It was really funny. Um, so I wrote it down in my little book, and now that joke happens every night I do the trick. I, I manufacture that moment, you see? And that's how the trick sort of wrote itself. Um, another thing, it's really difficult to <laughs> This is the night I decided to replace the rubber chicken with a real frozen chicken. <laughs> I just did it on a whim, and now I do it every time I do the trick. Uh, and it, it takes a very special type of person that I bring on stage. It's hard to pick the person. 
uh, I have to pick them before the show. They don't know what they're going to do. They just know they're going to be in the show. When you have an audience of like 800 people, you have to, I, what I do is I watch people when they're coming in and I decide it has to be someone who can take a joke and not necessarily make the joke. But they have to be someone who can take that joke. And here's an example. I was in South Korea doing a USO tour for the troops. Here's a couple of those guys. And one night, it was one of the first nights I was performing, I got a girl on stage, she was awesome. She was going along with everything, so I did the joke with where I make her blow up a condom and then we throw it away and we say it has nothing to do with the trick, I just want to see if you would do it. And there's a whole bunch of different things and the soldiers were catcalling her and yelling at her and everything and she was going along with it and she loved it. Someone came up to me after the show and said, excuse me, Michael, did you know the girl you had on stage is the general's daughter? <laughs> no, I did not know that. But the general, he was playing a joke on me, it was true, but he loved it and he bought me beer all night long. The chicken became so much a part of my act that it worked its way into my logos and my branding because people would actually call me on the phone and say, Michael, we want you at our event again next year, but you got to do the chicken. I have the perfect person for you to use. Uh, so now it's, you know, it's on all my logos. So now we come to the big question, how do I do it? Unfortunately, the number one rule of magicians is that you do not tell how you do a magic trick. But I can tell you this. Uh, you don't always have control of your mind. And optical illusions are a good example of that. Sometimes we don't know what's happening in our mind. We see one thing, we perceive another. For example, find the gray dot or the black dot. If you look at this, there isn't one, but your mind might kind of trick you into thinking that there is one here. Optical illusions are a good example of that. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> I'm not gonna say that my, the way I do this trick is an optical illusion, but I can leave you with this. It's one of these two things. In the end, I had to figure out whether or not it was easier to find a way to get that card into the chicken, or whether it was easier to convince the audience that it was ever there in the first place. Thank you.